Okay, so hi, I'm Orben Zev from JP Morgan. And I'm very glad to be here, and even more glad that my parents didn't come over, because <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. Um, okay, so let's, let's start. Uh, we at JP Morgan have um, a very large project related to Python. And I think it's very interesting because it's unique, it's different. Uh, when I came over, I didn't imagine that something with this structure exists. So let's, let's share a little bit about it. So JP Morgan, this is the agenda. Not going to go over it. <laughs> so JP Morgan has more than 200,000 employees. I think it's already 270. And yes, more than 40,000 developers. I mean programmers, not people who are actually technical. They know what they're doing. They're not sitting next to the desk pretending to do something with the computer. And we process a huge amount of payments every day. We do risk analysis. We do a lot of kinds of data processing and trading. We have offices around the globe, so there's always someone awake and working. So we, we need to be ready for that, for a project that can live 24-7 or be updated 24-7. So Athena, this is the project I work on. It's a pricing, risk management and trade management platform. I think it's the biggest software running in Wall Street. It has thousands of servers and also thousands of developers. Most of it is Python. And it's built for rapid development. It puts really the developers as a real part of the business. It's not only a trading business. Today in the fintech world, time to market matters and developers do sometimes make the change between uh, different organizations. Technology is important. Uh, just to give you some other numbers, it's probably the largest Python code base in the world. I think that more than 25 million lines of code. And it has a very fast push to production mechanism. Someone can update production in about a matter of minutes. So during the trade, someone can do something. It's not something that you ship to production and hope it will reach the, like in a month. And uh, I think it has an average of 800 changes per day. 800 times we go on change production. And I think it's pretty impressive. So let's discuss uh, continuous delivery. There's a lot of noise here. Um, first, a developer, he writes code. There's some kind of a review process. And then we go into version, revision control. Something is being built. Of course, you test what you do. Uh, till here, it's continuous integration. If you go all the way, push to production, that's continuous delivery. So you need the thing, the change, to get into production and then deploy it. So then this is push to production, continuous delivery. Uh, let's discuss this a little bit. So the most important thing in this kind of model is time to market. You want to be fast. You want to get there. You want to push the changes fast. It drives the user satisfaction up. Because if I get a call or a developer receives a call and he says, well, I don't like this label on the button. If I don't have it, well, I'll tell him, yes, it's a five minute task. I'll just find the code. I'll make the change. I'll push it in. But we go to production only in two months. Well, he wouldn't be so happy. But I've done my thing. It took five minutes. And also, I will have to remember what happened. And if I maybe spelled something wrong, then it will take me, or maybe another developer will receive the task. And it will take me a long time to get back to it and get into the context. So my productivity will be much better. And also, but this whole process, usually, if I have a program that ships to production once every six months. So everybody knows I have one month of regression testing. 
So people will be really sure that this is stable because people clicked on all the buttons for a month and they're really sure that it's okay. But if there'll be a change and someone missed something, I wouldn't be able to fix it that fast because my process isn't made to be pushed to production or to fix production that fast. I'm used to really long release cycles. And all this in order to provide hundreds of changes to production every day, you have to rely on automation because we want to change 100 times a day production, but we don't want to break it 100 times a day. Uh, we want our customers to be happy. We want this to be useful. And there's a lot of money in the trade. If we do something really wrong, we might lose money. We might be down. This has a, like, a big price. If Facebook will be down for a few minutes, then they will lose a lot of money coming from advertisements. But we might lose our customers' money. And we will lose a lot of credibility. This has a really high price. And also, uh, continuous delivery is tricky with distributed systems. But yes, always deployments are tricky with distributed systems. But this is something you sometimes need to take into account. So let's discuss monolithic code base. Uh, that is, I think, the thing you don't know. Till now, most of what I said was pretty much familiar. So monolithic code base, it means all the code is in one global repo, one very big, very large repo, 20 something million lines of code. It's a trunk based development. It means head of trunk is what goes to production. We don't have a few heads. We actually have one head that matters. Um, we, are, we like small frequent changes. We do have some support for branches. And feature toggles is a good practice. Sometimes you can ship something with a flag that says it's off, or maybe you'll turn it on during runtime in order on some demo hosts. So let's discuss this. We believe that transparency brings quality, a little bit like open source. If you have the shame factor, if you share your code, on open source, you will care how it looks like, that people can understand it. So on a monolithic code base, that's a real important part of it. And it also uh, enables collaboration, less duplicate efforts for some utility class. Everybody sometimes in his career used some or developed some H, uh, XML parser. Like that's I think 20% of the developers in the world, what they do is they develop XML parsers or JSON parsers. Um, yes, um, this requires a big investment in tooling. It's not the standard methodology. And uh, it's hard and it's a challenge to keep the hygiene of the code base. You need to rule and be very strong to enforce some behaviors. Not any code standard is OK. We want some standardization. And uh, a single revision of a code makes life easier. You don't really care for the exact revision that was two months ago. What's in production, what's the head of trunk, is what matters. How does this apply to Python? Like, we didn't talk about Python yet, and I'm halfway through. So Python is special in a way that you don't need to compile everything. When you change one file or one model, and it's on your file system, you are running the latest. You don't need C++, Java, linkage, and long processes. You actually run against what you have. Um, so we focus our main constraints on code review and tests, as build won't break. Like there's there's no build, so no way it's going to break. We have uh, a lot of integration tests which fit the monolith code base model because let's discuss the other option, microservices. When you're a microservice, all you know is your small service and your integration test of what you think the world looks like. But that's your mock. It's a really small thing. 
if you have the whole world, the whole context, then you can test against the world. And the world or the other development team will update his processes. And then your integration test could be up to date. Um, I think this is one of the most unique things. We usually use Python and we load it from our file system. But what if we load it from somewhere else? We can load it from, a, we load it actually, from a key value storage. Imagine Redis. Let's say you had Redis and when the key is the path and the value is the actual code, the Python code. So, and there are other key value storages, but it's actually behaving a little bit like a distributed file system. Whenever you will update the Python file, you will say it goes to production, then it will be there. The process will start and it will use the latest and greatest. So actually deployment solved. You can reach production in no time, technically. And you don't have to package it all in one big zip. You can have parallel processes of development. So even if we go 100 times to production a day, it's not that developers are waiting for each other. They can run in parallel. So continuous delivery, you saw the previous uh, slide, but with Python, it's, it's easier. We can do this. We don't need to build. We don't need to package. We got ourselves two trivial steps. It's much faster than what it would become in a long compiling building language. Um, so how does it look like? A, a bit more code and technical. So if I have some key with a value, then I'll run lib bar and well, yeah, I'll run the hello uh, thing and I'll get the print, the wonderful pi data print. But when I run against the database, I have another option. Let's say I don't like the print. And yesterday I had an awesome print. Everything works. I was happy. So I can launch the Python launcher with my timestamp and say, well, I want to run this as yesterday. And I can do that. In most systems, you can't run production as yesterday. You can maybe in SVN take the code as yesterday. In Git, I think you, can, you can't even do that due to the branching process. Sometimes you have two and you can't choose the current one from yesterday. So I think it's very special and it enables a lot of things. So just consider someone taking the timestamps when all the regression tests passed and running with that regression test passed timestamp and knowing that everything was checked and delivered. And a bit more details. So we discussed about fast updating production, but someone would have to test himself because I write typos all the time. I wouldn't like to put my typo straight into production and someone uh, giving me a phone call complaining that it doesn't work for him. So I want to test myself. So when I run against production, so let's imagine we have some kind of a main in A. So A will import B, will import C, will import D. Everything is trivial, a little bit like file system. But over here, I have a different model of layering. I can open a very large number of developer layers, areas, where I can open B, put it in my area, and change it. This is the actually change I want to push to production. So I'll test it, I'll run it locally. When I'll do OS developer layer, I, A will import B and B will import C. And I'll get something like, like this. This will be my effective runtime environment. And it can even go, and oh, I always think about it a little bit like a cache miss. So I always go from the top to the bottom. If I find something, I take it. If not, then I go to the big production database, which has everything. There are no merges in runtime. So I pick the file that I have here. And, but there are no rebases, no updates, no pulls. What's in production is in production. It might change and 
I'm lazy loading it. I don't have all on my computer. So when a developer comes to his first day at work, people tell him, OK, use, you have the client or this and that, what needs to be installed. And you can use all the code. It's working. It's very complex to get something working like that for a new developer on a very large and scaled environment. Um, and I think this is being done very effectively. Sometimes, in some cases, there are groups and teams who need some more collaboration. They want a staging area. They want to share their code before it goes into production. So yes, you can work on one staging area, but sometimes it's not enough. So you can add more layers. So in this case, I'll add my developer layers on top of the shared staging. And what will be run is always the thing on top. So someone altered the main on A, and A will import B, B will import C, and C will import B for production. So production code, user developer area. Um, this is developer area, staging area, and production code. All in one computer, like in one pretty effective query. Um, so conclusions. Um, continuous delivery is possible at any scale, especially scale of a code base. There are ways which are not microservices. I'm not saying microservices are bad or wrong, but they are different approaches. Um, automation and fast feedback is important and critical to make better products and to enable push to production as time to, matters, time to market matters for us, matters a lot. And things are much easier with Python. No build, things can be updated individually and can be loaded from uh, key value storage. And well, it's not free, but it was worth for us. It is an important system for us. Um, so a few references. Uh, there is a reference from Google, and I think there's also some reference from Facebook somewhere uh, dealing with monolith code base and a code base that all the company can access. Um, and yes, we in Israel are growing our uh, center, tech center, and we are hiring. So thank you very much. And if someone has a question, I'll be glad to answer. Do you have some time on stage? OK, so questions, if, um, yes. How are your teams organized? Are they organized? Do they have people with all different kinds of skills, or are they organized around a certain kind of technology? Or uh... It varies and depends on the line of business. There are different lines of business with different org charts. So I can't, like, there are a few different organizations dealing with this system. Uh, you say that uh, different developers can run the integration simultaneously, independently, yes. if I understand correctly. Yes. Then how do you deal with match conflicts? Um, it's a bit of an implementation detail, but I'll give you some hint. We have some kind of a layer between the developer and production where you push from. So you put it there, and then you review. So you know what's the next upcoming change. You don't have a conflict on that. Um, in which uh, like cases would you not recommend like a large monolithic code base? Um, it depends what you're looking for. It depends on the language. So it wouldn't be relevant in C++. So if you want a C++, something that works on bare metal, maybe it wouldn't be the way. But for this case, you can add some binaries to the process that will be under the hood and get performance and change the logic, the more top layers, very rapidly. Um, for which cases I wouldn't select that, um, it, it varies because, oh, if you want to create less people to depend on you, if you're worried of a lot of people depending on each other, so they're not. But it enables you to enforce some really small things for something not to be too important or to know all the small environment you care about and don't care about the world. In some cases, it does make sense. Thank you.